who has won the Tour de France. Champion. Acceleration of Armstrong is absolutely frightening here. We're cheater. They say it's impossible. So he must be doing something. Legend. People look to him as a hero. Or liar. To think that I'm going to come back into sport and risk my life with performance enhancing drugs is crazy. Miracle man. This isn't going to stop me. Or a master of deceit. This is the story you don't know. You were either with him or you were against him. The drugs. U.S. Postal Service's pro cycling team, including Lance Armstrong, ran the most sophisticated and successful drug program that we've ever seen. The deception. Lance Armstrong is the greatest cheater in all of cycling's history. And the damage done. Lance Armstrong, an American success story. But a few hours with Oprah Winfrey changes that story forever. Did you ever take banned substances to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. After years of denials, Armstrong finally admits that none of his seven Tour de France victories was raced cleanly. Lance Armstrong used, possessed, and distributed these dangerous drugs all so that they could win Tour de France's. 1999, the U.S. Postal Pro Cycling Team goes to Europe with one unlikely goal, win the biggest race in cycling, the Tour de France. Lance Armstrong is the team's rising star and its leader. I was following him before I even started cycling. Tyler Hamilton is one of Armstrong's wingmen in the peloton, the fast-moving pack of racers. I was right in the middle of it for years. It was almost like we were one big family or one big fraternity. I was honored to be his teammate. The Tour de France is the Super Bowl of cycling. An epic three-week battle where riders from more than 20 teams race more than 2,000 miles through vineyards, up mountains, and all the way to the Champs-Élysées in Paris. Professional cycling is almost like a cross between NASCAR and horse racing. I mean, it is almost a full contact sport at times. Incredible human drama and suffering on the road. But in 1999, Armstrong thinks his team looks less like world champions and more like the Bad News Bears. The expectations were quite low. No one expected them to win for sure. Just three years earlier, Armstrong had been diagnosed with aggressive cancer. I was in denial. I thought this, this can't be because I'm 25 years old. Why would I have cancer? It involved, you know, chemotherapy, treatments, the drugs that really could have destroyed his athletic career. So he's incredibly lucky to get through that. When Armstrong enters the 1999 Tour de France, his best finish ever in the race is 36th place. His demeanor back then, he was a lot more, he was a lot more unsure of himself. He wasn't sure what he'd be like post-cancer. Armstrong in 1999 was a very much an outside threat. But in the race's early prologue stage, Armstrong stuns the crowd by blowing away the previous year's winner by 16 full seconds. That is astonishing. When Lance has a goal, you know, don't get between him and that goal. The moment starts Armstrong's comeback, one marked by extraordinary physical training and something else, performance-enhancing drugs. Armstrong's doping started back in the mid-1990s when he was on the Motorola team. In 2012, Steven Swart, a retired Motorola teammate, admits to doping while riding with Armstrong in the 90s. I first started doping to be there um, and, you know, and not let the team down. According to Swart, he, Lance Armstrong, and other teammates discuss and use banned substances. The conversations I had with Lance about doping was basically on the bike, out training, you know. There was serious talk about getting on the EPO program. Riders have been quietly using drugs to push past their physical limits for as long as bicycling has been a sport. But in 1998, the extent of doping in professional cycling is exposed to the world. At the start of that year's Tour de France, border police find a trunk load of banned substances in a car belonging to a French cycling team. The following year, race organizers try to move past the scandal and dub the 1999 race the Tour of Renewal. 
but according to some of his teammates in a report released by the United States Anti-Doping Agency, or USADA, Armstrong urges them to start doping. Convinced he knows what it takes to win the 1999 Tour de France, Armstrong surrounds himself with the best team possible. And, according to the USADA report, a critical player in that dream is Michele Ferrari, an Italian sports doctor that Armstrong has been quietly consulting for years. Dr. Ferrari in cycling was known as the guy who doped cyclists. He's known for taking a very intellectual approach to the sport of cycling, a, a real numbers-based approach. He loves spreadsheets, he likes to plug in numbers. But he's also accused by others of using questionable methods. Despite his reputation, Ferrari insists that his program is legit. According to the USADA report, some U.S. postal team members say Ferrari guides them in the use of banned substances. Tyler Hamilton is one of those riders. I started with a simple red testosterone pill. I didn't want to go against the grain. The Tour de France was right around the corner, and I knew if I wanted to make the, the team selection to get into the Tour de France, that um, that might be the deciding factor. Idealistic riders like Hamilton find themselves on a slippery slope. Basically, you would be given vitamin shots in the beginning and taught how to shoot up B12 into your veins, so you knew your way around a syringe pretty easily. And the real creepy thing was they would always say, everybody's doing it, just like you'd hear in high school. Even for athletes in peak condition, bicycle racing brutalizes the body. Banned substances like cortisone, testosterone, and human growth hormone aid in reducing pain and boosting muscle growth. In the long and grueling tours, though, there's an even more sought-after drug, one that targets the blood. There's a very, very long name for, for EPO. It's erythropoietin. And to hide it on the team, they called it uh, Edgar, as in Edgar Allan Poe. Synthetic EPO is often used to treat patients whose bodies can't make enough red blood cells. EPO increases the number of your red blood cells. And the red blood cells are what carry oxygen around the body. For cyclists, the extra EPO-created red blood cells feed oxygen-starved muscles, providing an unnatural and unfair boost in performance. As racers hit the walls of their cardiovascular limits, those doped on EPO are able to push past. You just don't finish tired, you know, a lot fresher. Uh, your recovery is so much quicker. According to the USADA report, once Armstrong and some of the other U.S. Postal Team riders perfect their use of EPO, the real problem becomes securing a steady supply of it during the 1999 tour. According to Tyler Hamilton, Armstrong devises a plan. During the race, an anonymous Frenchman waits for a call on his prepaid cell phone. He is actually Lance Armstrong's personal handyman, and is known to members of the U.S. Postal Team as Moto Man. Oui. After he oui. gets his instructions, he races off. With him, according to Tyler Hamilton, a thermos filled with EPO. Headed to an area that will be crowded with cycling fans, he is a shadow on the move. The Frenchman's mission? deliver EPO for Armstrong and key teammates whenever it's needed. The sophistication came not just from something like Motoman, but the idea of how Motoman fit into this grander plan. That like, okay, here's what we need, and here's who's going to provide it, and then here's how it's going to get to us in a way that's undetectable. Slipping into the U.S. Postal Team's RV, Motoman opens the package and stashes the goods. When riders return to the camper, they find EPO-filled syringes tucked into their shoes. According to Tyler Hamilton, riders put their used syringes into empty soda cans, dispose of the evidence, and get ready for the next grueling stage of the Tour de France. On July 13th, an elite group of riders breaks from the peloton and races to the top of a 6,000-foot mountain. 
The 1999 Tour de France is on the line, and cycling fans wonder if Armstrong, the underdog and cancer survivor, has what it takes. He wasn't an all-rounder, he wasn't a super climber, and his results in prior Tour de France, is, he couldn't match it with the top guys on the climbs. But Armstrong erases any doubts. But the acceleration of Armstrong is absolutely frightening here. Armstrong passes two of the sport's best climbers as if they're standing still. He's now heading up to a likely victory here at Sestria. He wins the stage by 31 seconds, propelling him even closer to the winner's podium in Paris. Lance Armstrong looks to the sky. I feel great, and even more importantly, my team feels great. We think that uh, we have a, a good chance of winning. Morale is high, but among the cheers, are whispers of foul play. The Armstrong camp is always quick to shut those down. When he does come back and he's successful and he leads the Tour de France and he possibly wins the Tour de France, do you know what they say? They say, it's impossible. So he must be doing something. We only have one thing to hide and that's our hard work. Behind the scenes at the Tour though, Armstrong has a big problem. One of his drug tests comes back positive for cortisone a drug that without a doctor's prescription is banned in cycling. According to sworn testimony by team masseuse Emma O'Reilly, Armstrong and team officials come up with a simple solution. Backdate a prescription for cortisone. So that the prescription technically started before the tour started, so that he'd already been taking cortisone. Emma O'Reilly, she was in the thick of it. She saw a lot of the things that were going on within the team. Racing authorities are satisfied with the explanation from Armstrong's camp. To think that I'm going to come back into sport and risk my life with, with, with performance-enhancing drugs is crazy. Accusations of doping are overshadowed by Armstrong's extraordinary comeback story. There is no doubt that the cancer, his coming back from cancer, had blinded everybody to what he was really doing. On July 25th, the world cheers him on to his first Tour de France victory. But to the man who has won the Tour de France, Lance Armstrong, only the second American cyclist ever. On the Champs Elysees in Paris, cycling's new king is crowned. It's been crazy. It's uh, obviously you're exhausted from the Tour de France itself, and so your body wants to take a rest. But there is no rest for the weary, and the need for speed reaches a whole new level. USA! USA! Against the odds and nearly everyone's expectations, Lance Armstrong wins the 1999 Tour de France. This is his Tour de France, Tour de Lance! Far from scaring him straight, a close call with a positive cortisone test seems to prove one thing. In the high stakes, high speed world of cycling, it's not just about being the best rider, but the best doper. Those were dark years, you know, doping was just massive back then, and it was, you know, the majority of the peloton was doing it. When it comes down to uh, the preparation or what you're doing or which doctor you're working with, that's the difference between being number one and number two. His top competitors, if they were using a certain drug or even asked someone about a certain drug, he certainly knew it and asked his doctors about it immediately. He really knew how to figure out what other people were doing so he would up his game. Part of the game? Staying ahead of the testers, which is about to get a lot harder. In early 2000, the cycling world hears rumors that a new test is being developed for EPO. According to USADA and some of Armstrong's teammates, Dr. Michele Ferrari and Armstrong have the inside line on the test and devise a way around it. A lot of people know how the tests work, but they had the intelligence to be able to say, okay, well, how do we use that information to make sure that I don't test positive? According to Hamilton, in the summer of 2000, at a discreet beachside hotel in Valencia, Spain, Armstrong, Hamilton, and another postal rider prepare for step one of a blood transfusion. They would take their own blood out, and then during the tour, they would put it back in, so that gives you extra red blood cells for endurance. The process of banking one's own blood isn't new, but its use by athletes as a way to artificially enhance performance has been banned since 1986. 
receiving blood transfusions in hotel rooms. That's a really dark place. After about an hour, bags of warm blood are put into coolers and go into storage. According to Hamilton, a few weeks later, on the 11th day of the 2000 Tour de France, the same three cyclists enter another hotel room, this one near Mont Ventoux, France. They grab a hanger from the closet and basically hang the blood bags from a pitcher hook on the wall and sit there on the bed and transfuse the blood. In less than 30 minutes, the blood they drained in Spain is back in their bodies. Tyler Hamilton has described it as having this feeling of this cold liquid entering your body. The riders' bodies, having naturally recreated the blood they lost in Spain weeks before, are now re-infused with trillions more oxygen-carrying red blood cells. Giving yourself more blood than you've currently got is the single best way of improving performance. EPO takes a long time. A blood transfusion, bang, wow, you're there. And unlike EPO, doping with your own blood is virtually undetectable. July 13th, two days after Armstrong and teammates are allegedly reinfused with their own blood, they set out on a notorious mountain stage of what Armstrong hopes will be his second Tour de France victory. Every mountain stage that you could finish was basically one step closer to Paris. Once again, Armstrong makes his move. Well, look at this then, Armstrong, and they wouldn't have expected that. Ulrich has done nothing about it at all. He saw the speed of the acceleration. He's chasing just one man on the road, the man who's in the pink jersey of Mercury. He catches up to one of the sport's greatest climbers, Italian Marco Pantani, who'd been disqualified from an earlier race for irregular blood values. And he's taken a real good look at Marco, almost as saying, the back wheel for you, Marco, jump on if you can. The men sprint up the 6,000-foot mountain. It's an extraordinary moment. I don't think anyone would have done that well on their mountain without doping. <laughs> Ten days later, Armstrong claims his second Tour de France victory. But once again, he faces doping accusations. He confronts his critics head-on and even uses his celebrity to publicly challenge them in a 2001 ad for Nike. Everybody wants to know what I'm on. What am I on? I'm on my bike, busting my ass six hours a day. What are you on? Betsy Andreu, wife of cyclist Frankie Andreu, and a former member of Armstrong's inner circle witnesses his tactics firsthand. Lance really relied on the media and politicians. He cozied up to politicians and to people in power. And so he built this empire. When an accusation comes up about doping in his career, those accusations are, are quickly shut down. Armstrong is undeniably persuasive. Why would I take that risk? I have everything I need. I have money, I have contracts, I have a family, I have my family's name. Do you think I want my son to go to high school in 2012 and somebody to say, oh, Luke Armstrong, your dad got busted. But behind Armstrong's confident denials, teammates say they play a dangerous cat and mouse game with the testers. Right now, on the record for all of America, the world here, have you ever used performance enhancing drugs? Of course not. Never. Ne not once. Cycling has been criminalized and singled out. Lance Armstrong fights back aggressively against doping accusations. But behind his public denials, teammates say Armstrong and others are engaged in an elaborate and risky system to avoid drug testers. One rider says he helps Armstrong narrowly escape a positive drug test at a 2000 race in Spain. George Hincapie, Lance Armstrong's right-hand man, actually texted to warn Lance that there are drug testers at the hotel. According to Hincapie, Armstrong has testosterone in his system and drops out of the race to avoid being tested. The team ran the program to ensure that they never tested positive by getting advance notice of the test, dropping out of races, when, when they knew that they were hot and would test positive. 
Tyler tells the story about when a tester comes to the door and he knows that if he gives a sample that he's going to get to test positive. So he and his wife both literally hit the deck and hide and pretend no one's home and the tester leaves. But that's how simple it is to evade a test. Just pretend you're not home. According to USADA, the team also uses other, more scientific ways to avoid positive tests. U.S. Postal Team cyclists say Dr. Ferrari develops new and nearly undetectable ways to administer EPO to the team. His doctor decided it was better to inject it intravenously rather than just injecting it under the skin. Injecting smaller amounts of EPO directly into their veins reduces the number of hours EPO stays in the system, which is key when testers are regularly making house calls. If you took it in the evening, didn't answer the door, the next morning you would be clear. I passed hundreds of tests when I probably shouldn't have. The time I was riding, you know, we had doctors that were one step ahead of the testers. At the beginning of the 2004 season, Armstrong and crew appear to be unstoppable. Remember John Gotti, the Teflon Don. Every time he escaped a conviction, his influence and power grew within the Mafia because they all believed he would never ever be convicted. Lance had sort of that aura that no one was going to ever be able to catch him. One win away from a record-setting six Tour de France wins, Armstrong is living the life of an international icon, complete with a rock star girlfriend, Cheryl Crow. He and his brand just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Through his cancer awareness charity, Live Strong, he's become one of the nation's most visible philanthropists. My friend, a true champ, a great American, Lance Armstrong. But all that money and all that fame teeters on a great lie. According to the USADA report, every single one of his Tour de France wins has been fueled by either testosterone, EPO, or blood transfusions. It's a secret he's determined to protect. Lance Armstrong is two people. He's a person who was beloved and who was very charismatic. And there's a dark side of Lance Armstrong and ruined many lives and intimidated people and ruined careers. Come back, come back, come back. Accusations, leaks, and threats are met with a swift counterattack by the Lance Armstrong machine. We're sick and tired of these allegations and we're gonna do everything we can uh, to fight them. They're absolutely untrue. Uh, we filed action in England, we filed action in France uh, against everybody involved, and enough is enough. You know, there wasn't a whole lot of in-between with Lance. You were either with him or and for him or you were against him. At the 2004 Tour de France, Italian cyclist Filippo Simeone finds out what it's like to be up against Armstrong. Simeone first lands on Armstrong's hit list in 2002 when he testifies against Armstrong's friend and consultant Michele Ferrari in a trial that convicts Ferrari on sports fraud. Lance in turn went after him. He went, to, went out to crush him. The conviction is later overturned. But according to USADA, as far as Armstrong is concerned, Simeone has done the unthinkable. He's broken cycling's unwritten law of omerta. Nobody speaks out. Nobody speaks out. Everybody, you know, takes the secrets. You're expected to take the secrets to the grave. At the 2004 Tour de France, the war of words between Armstrong and Simeone escalates. During the 18th stage, Simeone sprints away from the peloton to join a breakaway group. Armstrong, already well ahead in overall time, risks his own standing in the tour by wasting precious energy to chase him down. I've never seen this. As Simeone looks over his shoulder and says, I can't believe it, I've got Lance Armstrong with me. It's unprecedented that the yellow jersey the race leader would attack this late in the race and on such an inconsequential stage. Armstrong pressures Simeone to fall back from the breakaway group. In a stunning nod to Armstrong's power and influence, Simeone obeys. Then, cameras catch Armstrong's final handmade message, apparently referencing Simeone, zip your lips. That stands out to me as one of the, probably the ugliest moments I've seen in sports. He's a bully. Um, you know, he had a lot of power, 
within the Peloton. And it appears Armstrong will go to great lengths to protect that power and eliminate his competition, even if it's an old friend. Lance's former teammate, Tyler Hamilton, now racing for the Phonak team, is one of Armstrong's biggest challengers at that same Tour de France. Tyler's a favorite. I mean, Tyler has the experience. He has the knowledge that he had a big year last year. I wanted to stay on the right side of the Lance Armstrong camp because I knew once I got on the wrong side of that fence, he was going to make my life tough. Hamilton says that after a pre-tour race, he is called in for questioning by the International Cycling Union, the UCI, about a suspect drug test. He'd been uh, kind of put on notice by the UCI that he'd had some unusual results. He is shocked to hear from another cyclist, Armstrong confidant Floyd Landis, that it was Armstrong himself who ratted out Hamilton to the UCI. Lance has this kind of warped sense of honor. He wasn't above turning in, you know, ex-teammates and rivals when it suited his purposes. It's a scare, but Hamilton is told not to worry and to keep racing. It's not just the competition. Armstrong's own teammates who don't get with the program also feel at risk, including his good friend, Frankie Andreu. Before the 99 tour, Lance chides Frankie for having a bad attitude, not being a team player, being arrogant, which was all code for, you're not doing what it takes. Lance brought it up again in 2000. It's time for you to get serious. Those were the words he used to see Ferrari. While he is using all these drugs, intimidating people, people still saw Lance Armstrong as their hero. Millions and millions of people wore his yellow bracelets because he was their inspiration and they just could not see the other side. But Armstrong's public image is on a collision course with his secret life. You have never taken any performance enhancing drug in connection with your cycling career? Correct. Uh, and that would include any substance that's ever been banned. Is that fair to say? Correct. Okay. In 2004, an insurance company, SCA, refuses to pay Armstrong millions in bonus money amid reports of him doping. Armstrong sues them. It was from a syringe mark. And soon, his former teammates, an injectable. friends, I would prefer not to be here at the deposition, yes. And Armstrong himself are testifying under oath before lawyers. It affirmatively did not take I know place. I did. How could it have taken place when I've never taken performance enhancing drugs? Okay. How could that have happened? That was my point. You're not, it's not just simply you don't recall. Just uh, How many times do I have to say it? I'm just trying to make sure your testimony is clear. The case threatens to expose Armstrong's doping program, and he goes to great lengths to try to keep his secrets from being revealed. When Betsy Andreu arrives for her deposition, conducted by SCA attorney Jeffrey Tillotson, she's shocked to see Armstrong in the room. Betsy immediately jumps up and goes outside. We follow her, I do, and she is freaked out. She's like, oh my God, he's here, he's here. Why is he here? Armstrong sits across from Andreu during her entire testimony. What was it that your email to Mr. Armstrong said? Andreu refuses to be intimidated by his presence. I said you are very disrespectful to people. You treat people like <laughs> Frankie is a friend of yours. He's not an employee. We don't have to put up with it. Andreu drops a bombshell in her testimony when she recounts a conversation she says she heard Armstrong have in 1996 with the doctor who treated his cancer. And then came the question, have you ever taken any performance enhancing drugs? And Lance said yes, the doctor said what were they? And he said EPO, growth hormone, cortisone, steroids, and testosterone. He's sitting at the edge of the table staring at her you know, if he had mind control, he probably would have stopped her heart. Despite the damning testimony, Armstrong is later awarded $7.5 million. Just wanted the truth out. And this is a huge fraud in the history of sport. Shouldn't it be revealed? Shouldn't the truth be told? Shouldn't the truth matter? Once again, 
Armstrong's challengers are left in the dust. And the world watches in awe as Armstrong pushes himself even further at the 2005 Tour de France. Lance Armstrong has pedaled his way to an unprecedented seventh straight Tour de France victory. Still, doping accusations continue to haunt the sports legend. And in his latest moment of triumph, Armstrong thumbs his nose at his detractors. The last thing I'll say for the people that don't believe in cycling, the, the, uh, the cynics and the skeptics, I'm sorry for you. I'm sorry you can't dream big, and I'm sorry you don't believe in miracles. He knew that people knew he was doping. He knew that people were basically onto him and couldn't prove it. And he basically just threw it back in everybody's face. Then, at the top of his game, he retires. It's time for me to, to stop and go home and, and, and be a full-time dad. The following year, his friend and former protege, Floyd Landis, picks up the torch. If anyone was going to fill his shoes and become the next great American cyclist, it was going to be Floyd Landis. Since joining the U.S. Postal Team, Landis trained closely with Armstrong and helped him win three Tour de France titles. According to Landis, his time with Armstrong is also spent in the dark world of doping. He first was sort of indoctrinated into the doping program during the sort of warm-up race before the Tour de France. When he joined Lance Armstrong, he became something else. He was really inside all of the, the drug use. And in 2006, Landis continues the American winning streak and captures the yellow jersey. American Floyd Landis is celebrating his big victory today. I'll be happy about this for a long time. Now, it's Landis's turn on top. And like Armstrong before him, he's convinced they'll never catch his doping. But he's wrong. After his breathtaking win in the Tour de France, American Floyd Landis has tested positive for unusually high levels of testosterone. Landis desperately fights back against the charge. I would like to leave absolutely clear that I am not in any doping process. But when it comes to convincing denials, Floyd Landis is no Lance Armstrong. The levels I have had during the tour and all my career are absolutely natural and produced by my own organism. The cycling community is not convinced, and the UCI strips him of his title. He's banned from cycling for two years. In the world of cycling, when you test positive, they throw you out like garbage. You were nothing. The alienated cyclist is haunted by his failed drug test. If the world finds out that you have a positive drug test, then it's a disaster. Floyd Landis uh, fought his case for many years, took his two-year suspension, came back in the sport, and couldn't get a job on the highest levels of cycling. Not even with his old friend Lance Armstrong who three years into his self-imposed retirement makes a startling announcement on the Livestrong website. After long talks uh, with my kids, the rest of my family, close group of friends, I have decided to return to professional cycling in 2009. Armstrong says Landis threatens to go public with doping accusations unless he gets a job with Armstrong's new team, something Landis denies. Regardless, Armstrong turns his back on his old friend. Lance's shunning of Floyd was one of the worst mistakes he could have made. I think that was the moment where Floyd basically said, okay, the heck with it. Four years after his brief shining moment on top, Floyd Landis enters a Beverly Hills restaurant to meet with a cycling official. Landis sets an audio recorder on the table, presses record, and shatters the sport's code of silence. Landis unburdens himself of what he says are years of lies about doping on the U.S. postal team. Big props to Floyd Landis for finally coming out and telling the truth. Landis doesn't name Lance Armstrong, not yet. But the story he reveals lights the match for the firestorm that will soon envelop Armstrong. Floyd said, well, if you really want to know what's going on, I can tell you. Word of Landis's claims reaches Federal Food and Drug Administration agents who meet with the disgraced cyclist. 
Landis tells them about doping and cycling, and this time, he talks specifically about Lance Armstrong. Floyd Landis knew where all the bodies were buried. The FDA launches a full investigation into Landis's allegations. At issue is whether or not the U.S. postal team under Armstrong is guilty of fraud by engaging in doping and possibly trafficking banned substances, all while under contract with a federal sponsor, the U.S. Postal Service. A grand jury had convened in Los Angeles and Lance was in the crosshairs. Armstrong hits back. We have nothing to hide. We have nothing to, to run from. And he hits back especially hard at Landis. This is a man that wrote a book for profit that had a completely different person. February 2012. Two years after the federal investigation into Armstrong begins, it suddenly dropped without explanation. In a statement, Armstrong calls it the right decision. When the federal investigation closed, I think Armstrong justifiably felt like he dodged a bullet. But as soon as the feds step down, another investigation steps up under Travis Tigard, head of the United States Anti-Doping Agency, or USADA. No athlete should be put in the situation where to achieve their dreams, they have to resort to dangerous cheating. Though USADA is without authority in legal or criminal matters, Tiger can ban athletes from sanctioned sports for doping, for years, or even life. He approaches Armstrong's former teammates, including Tyler Hamilton, and they start talking. The people that were bound to this code of silence, they basically came forward and the whole thing blew open. Eleven Armstrong teammates testify against him including six active riders who are given six-month suspensions for their own doping. The powerful Armstrong machine is in high defense mode. After he passed every single test that was administered uh, and didn't fail a one and they couldn't prove him guilty, uh, they've now asked him to prove himself innocent. All I can say is that Lance Armstrong is defiant and he will always be defiant. But the tide is turning. The opportunity to come clean is just too appealing for some who were once in Armstrong's inner circle. It was just a massive, massive weight off my shoulders, and it felt so good um, that, you know, immediately I just, I, I knew my life had changed. I knew the, the right direction I was going to go, and uh, I wanted to scream it from the top of my lungs at that time. In October of 2012, USADA publicly issues a full report, and it reveals what they say is Armstrong's secret world. This was the game changer. This is what took it from being, you could believe one side or the other still. 1,000 pages lay out incident after incident of doping on the U.S. Postal Cycling Team. Names, dates, and locations, all in great detail. It's a scathing assessment of the man USADA paints as the ringleader, Lance Armstrong. I think it proves beyond any doubt. Unfortunately, the U.S. Postal Service's pro cycling team, including Lance Armstrong, ran the most sophisticated, professionalized, and successful drug program that we've ever seen. Lance Armstrong is the greatest cheater in all of cycling's history, um, obviously by not only by the number of tours he had won and by his success, but by the number of people he was able to co-opt into this cycle of deceit. I always thought the truth would come out because it's just too big, but I never imagined it would be what it is because we were so surprised by so much of it ourselves. Just the magnitude is, it's staggering, staggering. Just one week after the USADA report is released, Armstrong speaks at his Livestrong Foundation's 15th anniversary. It's been a difficult couple of weeks for me, for my family, for my friends, for this foundation. On that day, Tyler Hamilton saw a changed man. I know him well enough. I could see he was, he's broken, he's, he's a broken man. I mean, I could just tell by his voice. As the scandal grows, day by day, Armstrong's legend continues to crumble. On October 22, 2012, the UCI makes his disgrace official. Armstrong is stripped of his seven Tour de France titles. He is also banned not only from cycling, 
but from all officially sanctioned sports. In the spring of 2012, it was possible for, for Armstrong to come in to USADA and come clean like his teammates did and get a much shorter ban. With 2020 hindsight, it's easy to second guess legal strategies. They wanted me to try to win the tour, but... Another casualty? Sponsors like Nike, Oakley, Trek, and others drop him one by one. He's been told from, you know, 15 years old, you're special, you're different, you can do anything. And now he's being told for the first time in his life, like, you might be a jerk. Not only did he lie for so many years, he destroyed people that dared to tell the truth. His back against the wall, Armstrong makes his move. The history, the glory, and the legend of Lance Armstrong crumble under the searing allegations of the USADA report. By the fall of 2012, the once untouchable Armstrong is in a tailspin. Lance was, you know, such a powerful guy back in the day. And I never thought the walls would be crashing down like they have done. And yet, right after being stripped of his Tour de France wins, Armstrong posts a Twitter photo of himself lounging beneath his seven framed yellow jerseys with the caption, back in Austin and just laying around. I don't think Armstrong ever took it fully seriously right up until the end. I don't think he saw it for the threat that it was. But as the scandal deepens, this time, Armstrong can't just dismiss or deny the pressure. On October 17, 2012, Armstrong resigns as chairman of Live Strong, the organization some have called his greatest legacy. Finally, in January 2013, he makes his move. I think everybody could see what was coming that there was going to be some kind of admission. Lance Armstrong spent three hours with Oprah Winfrey today in what was described as an emotional interview. Some of his advisors were really against him going on Oprah. Um, and some of them thought, you know, it was, it was good maybe for his public image. That January night, millions watch around the world as Oprah gets right to the point. Did you ever take banned substances to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. But in the aftermath, some criticize Armstrong for not coming completely clean. I think the Oprah interview did him some damage because there were things he wasn't willing to address. He, you know, he, he denied dubbing in 2009, 2010, even though there's some fairly strong evidence that he did. In fact, USADA analyzed Armstrong's blood samples from those later tours, and the results indicate, with near certainty, that Armstrong re-infused his own blood. There was a one in a million chance of that meaning he was not doping. So why was Armstrong so adamant about not doping during those later years? Skeptics question whether his admissions are related to the expiration of statutes of limitations for some of the acts he committed during earlier tours. They wonder whether Armstrong is being cautious because he could be vulnerable for what occurred during later tours. I think his problems are just starting. We're seeking the repayment of over $12 million that we paid him in prize money for winning races that he now has admitted he cheated in, and he's been stripped of those titles. The most daunting threat may come from the U.S. Department of Justice. In February 2013, they announced they've joined Floyd Landis in a civil case against Armstrong for defrauding the U.S. government. He's facing a, what's called a key tam or whistleblower lawsuit from Floyd Landis. The federal government contends Armstrong violated the contract with the U.S. Postal Service by doping. Their lawsuit seeks to recoup millions of dollars paid out to the team. Armstrong's attorneys are contesting the lawsuit, arguing that the U.S. Postal Service actually benefited from its sponsorship of Armstrong and his team to the tune of $100 million. So what happens to him now? It's very hard to say, but it, it doesn't look good. There will be fallout from this story for quite some time. Yeah, I worry about him. I, you know, I hope he... I think the truth will do him a lot of good. I really do. People will forgive him. And he's still a champion in a lot of people's eyes. I like to win, but I fear losing. And I... And I, I uh, that might be what gets me up in the morning more than anything. For the man who said being afraid is a priceless education, 
the outcome of his fall from grace is still unfolding.